Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome to the event space somebody we've seen before in person, but today we have her virtually, Sandra Cohn. Sandra, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Scott. I'm so excited to be here. Super excited to have you. For those of you who are joining us, in case you just clicked on a button and were like, oh, let's check this out. Uh, we're talking photographing newborns with strobes and flash today with Sandra, so she'll be addressing that. So I want to give first and foremost a huge thank you to Sandra for being here, as well as our sponsors over at Westcott for sponsoring this event. And just as a reminder, if this is maybe your first time here or thousandth and you just haven't utilized it yet, we implore you to ask any questions that you may have for Sandra. So if you're joining us here on the Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. If you're joining us, YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, any of those, you can use the comment section and we'll make sure to get them over to Sandra so she can address them. But that's enough talking from me. I'm going to hand over the mic to Sandra and come back a little later when we'll get those questions over. Thanks again for being here, Sandra. Yeah, I'm so excited. So Let's just dive in. I'm going to share my screen, Scott. And all right, we'll get started. Can you, can everybody see that okay? And so I think, I think you shared your second screen in front, instead of the first screen. Okay, we, we're going to try this again. Um, let's try sharing the screen. All right. How about now, Scott? How's that look? There we go. Now we're now we're now. Okay. See, it just takes a little, just keeping the live and the live stream. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started and start talking about photographing newborns with strobes and flash. So, first of all, welcome. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I I love speaking at BH. I love being in New York and being in the event space, but this is really fun too. So um, I'm excited to be here and can't wait to get started. So listen, you guys, learning how to create natural looking light with strobes and flash is an absolute game changer. I believe it's a skill that all photographers should have, but it's especially important for newborn and family photographers. And that's really because as newborn photographers, we often have to work in really weird places, right? Like sometimes we're asked to show up in hospital rooms. Like if you're doing a fresh 48 or something like that, um, you know, a windowless nursery, like how many times have you been asked to photograph in the baby's room and the baby's room doesn't have any windows. That's happened to me before dark homes. If you go to clients' homes and we also, you know, tend to work at certain times a day. I know from, for my clients, you know, a lot of my newborn clients have older, older kids. And so we're working around nap schedules, things like that. And of course we work all year long, right? Even in the dark days of winter, people are having babies. We don't have like a newborn season, like wedding photographers have wedding seasons. And so learning to create your own light is just really going to help with all of those circumstances that you can find yourself in. You're going to find that it's going to reduce your stress because you're going to be able to walk into any situation and make it work. But it's also going to have an incredible impact on your business. So it's going to minimize your time in post-production for one. And as you know, when you run your own business, time is money. So that's really important. It's also going to really help you create a, tr a trustworthy and reliable brand. And that's because once you start incorporating lighting into your workflow, um, your, your work just becomes so consistent. So the images that you show in your portfolio or you show on Instagram are the exact same quality of images you're going to be able to provide for each and every single client who stands in front of you, regardless of time of day or time of year or available light in the room. And that really does help build your brand and create a real trustworthy brand. When you're a business, trust equals sales. So in that way, it's going to help you build a more profitable business. So I'm really passionate about this topic and teaching it specifically to newborn and family photographers. That's why I'm so excited to be here with you today. So really quick, though, I do want to introduce myself just in case we haven't met before. All right. So I'm Sandra Combe, and I'm an award-winning uh, newborn and family photographer. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, I'm also a certified teacher. So I like went to teacher school to teach people and I'm an industry educator. I'm a best-selling author. I'm a proud Westcott top pro. And then I'm also just like a normal person. I'm a mother of twins. I'm a wife. I'm a French bulldog owner. 
and a craft cocktail enthusiast. So that's just a little bit about me. And I started my business as a side hustle <laughs> way back in 1999. Um, so I, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time, but I actually didn't start using artificial light in my own work until 2011. So for the first 12 years of my career, I worked exclusively with natural light. And that was actually something I was really proud of, right? Because natural light's beautiful. And knowing how to see it and use it and work with it really is like one of the superpowers that we have as photographers. But the problem with natural light is that natural light isn't always available, right? Sometimes it rains. I live and work in Seattle, Washington. So this is a problem that I'm very familiar with, okay? Some days are dark and some rooms don't have windows like we were just talking about and some conditions are just less than perfect and these were the problems that i was running up against in my own business when i had great light on a perfect day you know i had that gorgeous window light i could create really beautiful photos but the problem was when i didn't have great light when the light wasn't so perfect right then i really struggled and um and that affected my confidence. It was very stressful. It would make me feel bad when I would have to give people a, a, you know, a gallery that I knew wasn't my best work. And it was because of the light or the time of day or the conditions I was working in, like all of that. I just, I, I hated that. So I really learned this skill just to help me make it through the dark days of Seattle winters, just so I could bring a little consistency to my work. But what I really found was that the, the more I started working with artificial light, I actually prefer it. I came to prefer it over natural light, which is like oh, gasp. I know, but it's true. Like I love the tones that I get with, um, when I'm using artificial light, I love the consistency. I love the control. So that's a little bit of my story. Now, what are we going to learn today? Well, today we're going to go over some of the myths, some of the common misconceptions that um, people tend to have, especially natural light photographers tend to have around working with artificial light. I'm going to talk about some of the concerns that people have when we're talking about using artificial light with newborns and babies. And then I'm going to share the method. So my method, the three things you need to know to create natural looking light with strobes and flash. So that's what we're going to get into. And my goal for you today is that you're going to walk away from this talk, just really excited to start using artificial light in your newborn and your family work. Okay, so let's dive in and get started. And we're going to start with talking about some of the myths around artificial light. So the reason I want to talk about this is that there are a lot of people who are like me, who are natural light photographers and have been natural light photographers for a long time and are really resistant to getting started with strobes and flash. So if that's you, I just want you to know I get you and I want to just you know, like talk about the elephant in the room. Okay. So myth number one is that a lot of people tell me that they don't use artificial light in their work because artificial light is ugly. <laughs> and honestly, it can be right. We've all seen flash work. That's just not pretty. Sometimes you get those blown highlights or real hot spots or that harsh flashy look that people talk about that they really want to avoid. Another thing that's real common um, with artificial light, people who are new to, to working with artificial light is just by producing too much light. And so it, it changes the way you show up and you shoot. So you're shooting more like F8, F11, which can be fine if that's the look you're going for. But what I've found, especially newborn photographers who are used to working with window light is when you're shooting this way, it kind of creates um, outdated looking images. So when you talk about using studio lighting and particularly studio lighting in a studio, a lot of people get this vision in their mind of what those images look like. And all too often, the picture people see in their mind is something like this. Now, this is obviously a joke photo that I grabbed off the internet, right? But this is kind of what people tend to think about when they think about studio lighting. You know, this like, real kind of uninteresting light, everything really, really sharp, very stiff and boring. And what I want you to know is it doesn't have to be that way. Artificial light can look just as soft and just as natural and just as beautiful as window light. So for example, both of these images were taken in a completely dark room at my studio, but yet they had that really soft, beautiful window light look. Same thing, newborn in my studio, 
soft, beautiful, looks exactly like natural light. Okay. And the great news is, is that unlike natural light, artificial light is always available. Okay. It's always consistent and it's always exactly the way you want it. This is a big point. So if you want something like Nary, you can make light, you can create light Nary, right? But if you want something with a little more drama, you can create that too. And the real difference is, is when you're in control of your light, you get to decide how your work looks, not the weather, not the time of day, not the season, not the available light in the room. So you get to show up and create like the artist you are, instead of just showing up and reacting like so many of us are used to doing. Okay. Now, myth number two is that lighting is hard or that it is scary. And this is one I hear from people all the time. They stay away from lighting because it's intimidating. It feels scary. And I get it because this was actually a huge block for me, right? I'm a self-taught photographer and studio lighting, that sort of thing really did seem like something you had to go to school to learn. And I didn't go to, to school I'm self-taught. And so it was, it, there was a huge block around this for me. Um, artificial light also just doesn't seem intuitive. You know, like I was used to working with windows and walking into a room and seeing window light come in and watching the way, you know, it kind of fell on my, my client and knowing how to work with it. And I just didn't understand how I could do that with a flash or a strobe. That's just a really quick pulse of light. Right. So that, that it, it just didn't seem intuitive. It scared me. Also, every lighting tutorial that I ever looked up on the internet when I was trying to learn this stuff made lighting seem really complicated. So I'm sure everybody's had this experience where you Google, you get on the YouTube or whatever, or the Google, and you're looking up, you know, studio lighting, and you find these videos that were shot in like a huge studio space with like multiple lights and assistants and models who per sit perfectly still and hold their own reflector. And that's like, not how I work right at all. It just seemed way too complicated. It's not how I work. I work with little kids. They run all over the place. And so I was like, this is just never going to work for me. Um, but it was, it was overwhelming, which is <laughs> here, but here's the great truth. This is what I've learned is that you actually know most of what you already need to know to work with artificial light. So all the really hard stuff you already know, and that's because light is light. And if you can work with the sun shining through a window, you can absolutely work with a bulb shining through a soft box. The same rules apply. All right. And that's actually what I'm going to teach you today. So my approach to teaching light is I want to take, I want to show you what you already know about working with natural light and working with window light and just show you how you apply that to working with a strobe or a flash. Okay. So that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm going to, I want to walk you through that process, but before we get into that, I do just want to take a moment to talk about newborn safety, right? Some of the concerns, because I know, um, you know, the question of whether or not it's safe to use a strobe or a flash when working with a newborn or with a, a young baby is something that I hear about all the time. I get notes from my, my clients asking me this question. Um, I get, you know, messages on Instagram or emails from people who are wanting to learn how to use studio lighting, but are worried about safety. So let's have that conversation. Now, in 2015, there was an article published in the Daily Mail, yes, a publication that is kind of known for questionable journalism, first of all. But anyway, the story was about a three-month-old Chinese baby who was left partially blind after a relative took a photo of the baby using a flash on their camera. And this article, even though it was published in 2015, still comes up to this day. Like I said, parents are concerned, photographers are concerned. I get quoted this article so much. So I wanted to talk about it specifically uh, just really quick. So first of all, this story has been fact-checked by multiple sources and has been found to be false. This is a screenshot I took from Snopes, but um, if you want any of the links that I'm going to be quoting here, just ask me, send me a DM and I'll send you all this research. But anyway, it's been proven false by multiple sources. And it's interesting because if you start, you know, researching it a little bit, you'll find that there's actually a lot of doctors, a lot of ophthalmologists who have weighed in on this discussion. So this is a quote um, that I found on Yahoo Parenting 
by an ophthalmologist, Dr. Alex Levin, who said that th if this story were true, there would be a lot of blind babies out there. To attribute blindness to taking a photograph would be incorrect. There is no way a camera could cause uh, such damage. And in the article, he then goes on to explain things about the retina and stuff that I'm not qualified to discuss. But is it safe? Yes, it's safe. Um, babymed.com. The flash of a light from a camera is no brighter than the light outside in the middle of the day, which is fine for a baby in small doses. The only harmful light condition you should help your baby avoid is direct and constant sunlight. All right. And we all kind of know this. I mean, the truth is any light would be uncomfortable or even potentially harmful if one were to sit and look at it directly for a long period of time. Right. But we don't do that. And we don't do that when using a strobe or a flash either. The truth is when you have a strobe or a flash set up, first of all, that pulse of light that comes out of the strobe or the flash unit, it lasts for a fraction of a second. It's extraordinarily fast. And when using the method that I'm going to be teaching, uh, the power of that strobe is also pretty relatively low. So it's already turned all the way down. Okay. Then how I set up my lights, I always have my light pointed away from the baby. So it's never flashing directly at the baby or my subject. It's always, you know, pointed away and it's inside a modifier with diffusion. So it's softening the light. All right. So here's just what that looks like. I always have my strobe unit facing the back of my umbrella and then it bounces out. So that's a level of diffusion. And then I also put a one-stop diffusion panel on the top. So it's very soft. That light is very soft, very subtle by the time it actually reaches the subject. So most of the people that I photograph, babies and adults alike, don't even notice the flash pop when I hit the shutter, right? And in fact, sometimes I don't notice it. So I have my uh, strobe set to beat when it flashes so that I know that it's going off because sometimes I'm, I'm not noticing it too. And I want to make sure it's working. Um, Takeaway from this, is it safe to use strobes and flash when working with newborns? Yes, it is. It's absolutely safe. Um, my method has some built-in safety measures to it. And I'm going to share that with you in a minute, but even if you're using strobes and flash differently than I teach, it's, it's completely safe to use with newborns and babies and small kids. All right. So let's just go ahead and get into the actual method. Um, creating the natural light look. So for years now, I've told people that my method for working with strobes and flash is all about creating the natural light look. That's even what I titled, titled my book. My book is called Crafting the Natural Light Look. But really, what does that mean? Okay. What do I mean by the natural light look? Because the truth is, you know, natural looking light can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So let me tell you what it means to me. All right. So when I started with strobes and flash, my goals were very, very simple. Um, I never thought that I would be asked to teach it or speak about it or write books about it. I really just wanted consistency. I just wanted to be able to consistently recreate the look of window light on a perfect day. That's what I was going for. Remember at the beginning of the talk, I was talking about how when I had great light, I could produce beautiful photos, but when I didn't, my photos suffered. I wanted to alleviate that problem. And so for me, crafting the natural light look was about creating ideal window light. All right. So that meant like that North light look, you know, real, even, um, soft light. You know, I wanted the kind of light that would allow me to shoot wide open. Cause that's kind of my style. I love a shallow depth of field. And I wanted to be able to do that even when using strobes and flash. Um, I wanted something that was going to help me create really beautiful catch lights and soft, subtle shadows. That's what I was going for. Now, natural looking light may be look different to you. Like you might enjoy like lighting that's a little more contrasty or a little more dark and moody or something like that. But what you need to know is that everything that I'm going to teach you today about creating my version of ideal light can be applied to creating your version of ideal light as well. All right. Same rules apply. So the th three things, three base things you need to know to create your version 
your ideal version of natural looking light are just this. So you need to uh, know a little bit about the power of your strobe or your flash unit and how to control it and why that's really important to creating your look. We also need to get into talking about size and shape of your light and how, you know, what effect that has on the light you're creating and the look you're creating and then light placement, where to put your light, how far, you know, how high, all those sorts of things. Okay. That's what we're going to talk about. So let's get into lighting power. All right. Now, controlling the power of your light is really going to allow you to control the depth of field that you're using in your work, right? It's going to, and that's really going to help you create a look that is consistent with your natural light photos. So the first question I always ask people when we're getting into this process of, you know, creating natural looking light for them is how do you like to shoot? You know, let's start there. You know, look at your natural light photos and what are the qualities about them that you notice? So, you know, this is a great place to start. So do you like to shoot wide open? Do you like a shallow depth of field? I do. I love that. This is a very classic Sandra Cohn photo where we can see the baby's eyelashes are in focus, but their tiny little hands and ears are <laughs> love that. All right. Well, if you like shooting wide open, then you know that when you set your flash up or you set your strobe up, you're going to be working at relatively low power, right? So the, it will allow you to open up like that, but maybe you like a deeper depth of field. You know, this, this image was shot at F11. Maybe you like that, or maybe you're used to working with larger groups and families. And so you want to make sure that every person in the frame is in focus, right? So in that case, you're going to work on the higher end of your power, right? So that you can stop down. So you have enough light to do that, right? That seems pretty simple. But then the question is, all right, well, then how do you know where you set your light to, like what that power needs to be? And the simple answer to that is by metering. Okay. Now, a lot of people who are working with strobes and flash, and honestly, I've even seen people who teach working with strobes and flash tell people that you don't have to worry about metering. Um, if you're a digital photographer, you can just look at the back of your camera and adjust your settings and adjust your light until you get it looking where you want it to be. And that does work. You know, I'm a film photographer, so my cameras don't have a screen on the back. So my meter is, is literally my eyeballs. So it's really important to me. But I'm a big believer that um, we should all be metering, whether you shoot digital or not. And especially those of us who work with newborns and kids, because when you're working with newborns, you're working with little kids, you really don't have a lot of time and you're going to um, miss opportunities misexpressions, um, things like that. If you are spending all your time looking at the back of your camera, adjusting your lights, fussing with your camera, adjusting your lights, fussing your camera. Instead, you can come in, you can just meter, get that, know exactly what your settings need to be right away. And um, you're not going to lose the attention of your little tiny clients, or you're not going to lose any of these moments, right? You're just going to be able to get in there and shoot. Now, when you're metering for you know, where to, to figure out where to set your power to when you're working with a strobe and, and flash, really what you want to do is you want to start by determining, like we were just talking about how do you like to shoot, right? What is your desired aperture? Where do you want to be at? And then set up your meter, set your meter and adjust the power on your lights until you reach that aperture. Now, when you're metering with strobes and flash, it's very important that you have your meter set to flash mode. And um, there are lots of tutorials out there on how to do it. I have a few on my YouTube channel. So if you want to see me teaching you just quickly how to get your meter into flash mode, you can check that out. But you want to meter, you want to, you know, pick your desired aperture, and then you want to meter adjusting the power of your strobes until you get there. And again, that's going to be different for every single person, depending on the look you're going for. All right. So for me personally, when I'm working with newborns, I like to shoot at F4. I'm going to tell you why in a minute, but quickly, I just want to talk about these settings here. So it says ISO 800, um, 125th F4. Okay. So ISO 800, like I said, I'm a film photographer. My go-to film is portrait 800. And so that is why my ISO is 800 is because I'm shooting portrait 800 film. If I were shooting this digitally, I would be shooting at ISO 100. When I shoot with my digital camera, that's what I do. Um, I'd still want to be at F4. And the reason why I like shooting at F4 
with my newborns is because I can come in and get gorgeous pictures of the baby. I still have like kind of a shallow depth of field at F4 and it, it's really beautiful, but it also makes it really easy to pop in other family members. So when I have my camera set to F4, I have my light set, everything, the camera settings, everything's good to go. And I don't even have to think about it. I can just focus on my baby, focus on the family. I can easily bring in a sibling and I don't have to change anything. I don't have to move my lights or re-meter or change my settings. I know it's enough. And then I can get some sibling shots. I can add a parent in, same thing, easy peasy without having to change anything. I can even photograph the entire family without having to move my lights or change my settings or re-meter or anything. And because I work with newborns and little kids and families, um, time is of the essence, right? So this just helps my sessions run nice and fast and efficiently. So those are my settings. Could be something different for you. So again, start with asking yourself, how do you like to shoot, right? What's your desired aperture? And then you meter and just adjust the power in your lights until you reach that aperture, okay? The next thing you need to know is you need to understand size and shape of your light and how that's going to affect the look of your light, okay? So the size and shape of your light has a huge influence on the light you produce when working with strobes and flash. And this is something that's really important to know when it comes to choosing modifiers. Now, friends, choosing a light modifier, so a softbox or an umbrella, that sort of thing, it can be really overwhelming and it freaks a lot of people out, okay? <laughs> like, so if you've ever walked into the lighting department of B&H, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you walk into the lighting department and there are modifiers of all shapes and sizes, right? There's big ones and small ones and round ones and square ones and tall skinny ones and things like with barn doors or grids and snoots, things called snoots. I always thought that was just like the best word, you know, like, and that's where a lot of people get stuck because there are so many choices. Um, it becomes overwhelming and people don't know what size they need. They don't know what shape they need and they're afraid of buying the wrong thing. And so they just don't buy anything and they walk out and say, well, I guess studio lighting isn't for me. Again, I totally get that. But when choosing a modifier, it really is quite simple. You just need to go back to what you already know about working with window light, okay? So what do we know about windows? Well, we know that big windows create soft shadows, right? And we know small windows create sharp defined shadows. So if you just wanna start there with like, okay, what size modifier do I need? Just think about those rules because the same rules apply when, uh, when you know, working with studio lighting. So P.S., I know that this isn't a photo of a newborn, but these photos of this model were the best ones I had to illustrate this point. So I just wanna show you this. Big modifiers equal soft diffuse shadows. You can notice how that light's falling on her. Really soft, subtle shadows, really pretty, right? And I photographed this image with the Westcott 53 inch deep umbrella with the diffusion panel on the front, okay? Small modifiers equal sharp defined shadows. So same model, same light. Um, we just changed out the modifier on this one and we were using a little teeny tiny light dome from Westcott. I love this little light. It's fun, like a little spotlight, but you can see the difference when they're side by side. Large modifier, soft diffuse shadows, small modifier, sharp defined shadows. So when you're choosing a modifier, when you're shopping for a modifier, start there. What kind of light do you like? What, what kind of light are you trying to recreate or create? You know, if you like something more soft and subtle, you're going to want a bigger modifier relative to your subject, right? If you want something a little, with a little more drama, um, a little more like fashiony or um, just sharper, harder, then you're going to want a smaller modifier. All right. Start there. Um, the next thing you want to look at is the shape of your modifier and the shape of your modifier um, has a huge impact on the catch light that you're going to get in your subject size. This is a good place to start. So again, square modifiers are going to create square catch lights, right? Round modifiers are going to create round catch lights. So why does this matter? Well, again, like what kind of look are you trying to create? When I first got started with strobes and flash, it was really important for me that my work looked exactly like the work that I got from my windows on a perfect day. And so for me, I wanted to have a square catch light. 
So the first modifier I ever purchased was the Westcott Apollo 50 by 50. It's this giant square, big rectangle. It looks exactly like a window, right? And so I would get those really nice square catch lights. Some people though prefer round catch lights. That round shape matches the shape of the eye. Um, it can match the sun. If you're using strobes outside and you wanna mimic the sun. So that's another thing you wanna consider when purchasing modifiers. You know, what kind of catch light are you going for? The bigger your modifier relative to your subject, the larger that catch light's going to be. So for me, I love big chunky catch lights, but I also now work with umbrellas, which are gonna produce a round catch light. But because the, that umbrella I work with is so big, it's gonna produce these catch lights that, that kind of like wrap around the eye, still creating that really pretty window light look, all right? So I like soft light and big catch lights. So for me, I'm gonna go with big modifier, right? Because that's the look I'm going for. If you want something a little different, then you can like you know, a little harder, a little sharper, go with a smaller modifier. Light placement, all right. The placement of your light, where you put it exactly, is the last piece of this puzzle, right? So you need to consider this when you're working with strobes and flash. And again, you wanna to look to what you already know about working with window light to help determine where to position your light. So what do you already know about window light? Let's break it down. Well, you know that the closer you are to a window, the bigger that light source seems, right? The bigger the window seems because you're right up against it. You also know the closer you are, the brighter that light's going to be, right? And you know, the closer you are, the softer that light's going to be. It's just going to kind of come down and wrap around your, your subject like that. Um, farther away, harder the light, farther away, dimmer the light, farther away, the smaller that, that light source is going to be. All right. Well, the same rules apply when working with artificial light. The closer you are, the bigger it is, the closer you are, the brighter it is, and the closer you are, the softer it is. So again, what kind of light are you trying to produce? If you like things that are, if you like that real soft light, then you're going to get that big modifier. You're going to bring it in nice and close. All right. Um, if you want something a little harder, you can pull that light away and you can create um, harder light, something a little sharper just by, just by moving your light around like that. I personally like big soft light. So I bring my light in nice and close. My light's always about three to four feet away from my subject when I'm working with my people. And because I know that the closer that light is, the brighter it's going to be. Again, I'm really making sure that I'm metering the whole time and adjusting the power on my light so that I'm always at my desired aperture, which for me is F4. So for example, if I were to move my light away, I would have to re-meter because the light would get dimmer. If I'm bringing it closer, I'd have to re-meter because the light's getting brighter. So just something to think about with that. Now, newborn photographers, your, uh, the placement of your light is hugely important, especially when working with babies who are either lying down on a bed or in a parent's arms. And this is something I, I see happen a lot in photography where people make this mistake that I'm going to tell you not to do right now. So <laughs> when working with newborns, you always want to make sure that your light is placed at the top of their head and not at their feet. All right. And that's because we're wanting to create really beautiful light that looks natural and soft. And when the light is placed at the top of the baby's head, it's going to fall down their face from the top down and create butterfly light, right? which is, you know, light that just falls gently down the face. You're going to get a little shadow under the nose. You're going to get a shadow under the chin. Okay. Now this is a natural way that we see light. So if you go outside, you're standing, the sun's in the sky, light falls down your face. So your shadows go under your nose and under your chin. This is what the brain's used to seeing. When we see things that are uplit, so lights coming this way, that's not a natural way for things to be lit. And it can become, it's unsettling. That's why they use it in horror movies all the time. You know, that like uplight look, because it makes us feel uncomfortable. It's not a natural light way that we see light. And I see so many photographers, newborn photographers, make the mistake of accidentally uplighting the newborns that they're working with because they are laying them on line, just laying them down flat on a bed and they have their feet pointed towards their light and so their head, right? It happens if you're using a window or a strobe. But what happens is the feet are facing the light, then you are uplighting that baby. So the light's hitting the chin first, 
falling up the face and creating really unpleasant shadows around the eyes and the nose. We don't want to do that. So when you're working with a newborn, when it comes to positioning that baby, um, and your light really make sure that you're always pointing the baby's head towards the light and not their feet. All right. It makes, it makes a huge difference and same rules apply when they're in a parent's arms. So if you're working with a parent, they're holding that baby, make sure they're holding them in such a way that their head is pointed towards their, towards the light and not their feet. So there's feet. See how that baby's uplit. Dad looks great in both, both images. Light looks good on dad, but the baby looks really great. Great here. You see the catch lights in the top part of the eye and here baby looks a little off. It's a little weird because that baby's uplit. All right. So even when a parent is holding the baby, you want to make sure that your, your uh, light is placed at the top of that baby's head and not at their feet. All right. So let's just recap really quick what we got going on here. So how do I produce my natural light look? Well, for me, that natural light look is that soft, subtle North light look. And so I'm always working with the power of my strobe relatively low. I meter and then adjust that power, adjust my lights until I'm getting that F4 reading. That's what I'm going for. I use a big modifier relative to my subject. And I like to bring that modifier in nice and close to help create that soft light look, right? I also know that it's important that we're always photographing our babies with the light coming from the top down. So I make sure that the baby's head is always pointing towards the light and not their feet. Okay. Remember that the power and distance of your light are going to affect the brightness and the softness of your light. So metering is your best friend. All right. Big light modifiers equal soft diffuse shadows, small modifiers equal sharp defined shadows. So when you go in to purchase your modifiers, think about that, right? It's going to help guide you um, when you're making those purchasing decisions. And also remember that that shape of that modifier is going to affect the catch light that you get in the eyes. So if you want a square catch light, go with square or rectangle modifiers. If you want a round catch light, go with a round modifier, right? Easy peasy. Okay. Keeping those things in mind are going to help you create your version of ideal light. All right. Now equipment, everybody wants to talk about equipment. And I actually love talking about equipment as almost like the bonus myth. So you know how at the beginning I talked about two myths that keep people from using strobes and flash <laughs> that they think strobes are ugly and they think it's hard. Well, the bonus myth is that lighting, getting into lighting, buying all that equipment is just too expensive. All right. And I get it because, you know, you're a small business and as a small business, money is always tight. And the last thing you want to do is invest in a bunch of gear that you're never going to use. Right. So what you need to know is you actually don't need a ton of gear to get started with strobes and flash. When I first got started with this, like I said, I, I would see a lot of YouTube videos and tutorials, and it was always all of this gear and reflectors and different modifiers. And I thought that that's what I needed to. And it kept me from getting started because I was worried about money. But the reality is every, you can just do this with one light. Everything I do to this day in my stu studio, I do with just one light one strobe unit, a radio trigger so that my camera can talk to my flash, a light modifier, and an external light meter. That's really all you need. And like I said, if you're a digital photographer, you can get away with not having a light meter, even though I really recommend it. So my go-to gear, the gear that I use in my studio is I use the uh, Westcott FJ200. I love this little uh, strobe. It's, it's really small. It's lightweight. It's also wireless, which is great for me because I work with kids. And so it's nice just not to have to worry about anything that anybody can trip on, right? Like wires or anything like that. My go-to modifier is the Westcott seven foot umbrella. I use the shoot through and not the bounce. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, why I make that choice, but I love that modifier. Um, and then I also use the Westcott seven foot diffusion panel that I put over top of it. And my, the light meter I use is the Sekonic light master. I love all the Sekonics, but that's my year list. Now, really quick, Sandra Cohn, 
why do you use a shoot through umbrella and not a mouse? Um, if you were wondering why, when you were seeing my behind the scenes, just know you're not alone. I get, I get email or messages literally every day from well-meaning people on the internet telling me that I'm using my modifier wrong. Okay. So I use it this way intentionally because I just like the way it looks. So with the shoot through umbrella, the lights pointed towards the back and I am losing light out the back, right? That light shoots out the back and then it bounces around my studio. And then I also get light coming out the front. So I get those really nice catch lights and a little bit of directional light on the subject that I'm photographing. As you can see here, because of the way that the light is bouncing around my studio, I get like really even light across the wall. So notice the, the wall in both of these pictures and how even the light is with the shoot through. For me, that is really important because I photograph newborns, but I also work with kids and families and toddlers. And having my light set up this way allows them to run and jump and play and move, which kids do, and still have really great even light. So no matter where they are, that little piece of flooring is five feet by seven feet. So as long as they stay inside that area, I know that they're going to be perfectly lit. I can shoot them at F4 and uh, no matter where they are in that space, which is really important. You can see with the bounce umbrella, because it's a bounce umbrella, it's more direct. You have a lot more control with it this way. So if you want to have a little bit more control over your light, then this is definitely you want to get like a bounce umbrella because it's going to give you that. So the light's a little more directional. Um, it's still soft and beautiful because it's a huge modifier. These are the seven foot umbrellas, but you can see the difference um, there, hopefully. Now, one question I get when I show people um, a shot like this is, does, does this only work, the shoot through only work like this for me because I'm working in a studio with white walls, which would make sense, right? Because you'd think that light would come and bounce all over the place. But the answer is no, like I've actually shot this setup. I shot this exact setup um, in 2020 at uh, WPPI on the show floor in the Westcott booth. And we got beautiful, soft images with it. And um, I have people who use this approach that are in my lighting course, you know, all over the world and all different situations and have great results. So if you're curious as to why I do this, I would recommend giving it a try, like play around with it and see what you prefer. Here's a close up of the two, just so you can see a little bit further. You can see that, sh that uh, shoot through. Do you see how like soft that highlight is on, on the baby? Whereas we get a little a harder light with the bounce, very subtle. I'm sure my clients wouldn't notice, but I notice. Um, and look at the shadow as well of coming off the baby. There's a little difference there. And here's just one more view of that. Sorry for the super creepy baby doll model, by the way, but <laughs> when I need to do a light demo, she never argues with me and she sits really still. So. Um, so that is why I use the shoot through umbrella and not a bounce umbrella. Like I said, give it a try. All right. Now. Okay. Final word on this friends, learning to use strobes and flash really helped me create my signature look and build my brand. Right. Um, it's the one thing I think that helped me stand out in my saturated market because it really elevated my work. My work is so consistent. I know that, that regardless of what's going on outside in the world, I'm going to be able to show up and give my clients the kind of work that I share on my Instagram, the kind of work that they see in my portfolio, the same quality work. And that is so important for my business. So it really did help elevate my brand, help me create that signature style that helped me stand out in a saturated market. And that's the thing that led to me building a really profitable newborn and family business. You know, I can shoot any time of day. I can shoot any time of year um, under any circumstances. I could shoot in the middle of the night. My photos would look exactly like they look on a sunny day. And that's so liberating. I can't tell you. Um, the great news is this one simple skill can have the same, do the same thing for you. It really is such an important skill to have as a newborn and family photographer. So I really encourage you, if you've never worked with strobes and flash before, give it a try. You're going to love it. You're going to become addicted like me. And if you take one thing away from today, I really do want it to be this. All right. Don't let something as silly as bad light hold you back from sharing your gift for the world. As a visual artist, you guys, 
You literally are the only person in the entire world on the entire planet who can see something and capture something the exact way that you see and capture it. That's a huge gift. So don't let bad light hold you back from doing that. All right. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to your clients to be able to consistently produce beautiful work, regardless of the weather or the windows or the available light in the room. And you deserve to feel really confident every time you pick up the camera. All right. So um, I hope you learned something today. I hope it was interesting. I'm excited to get into questions. What I want you to know is that we have a lot of free resources on lighting. If you go to my Instagram at Sandra Cohn and go to the link in bio, you can see I have, um, cheat sheets that are, uh, yeah, getting started guides, like cheat sheets and stuff like that. that you can download, I have the equipment list you can download. So you can go there and get a ton of free resources. And of course, uh, send me a DM, say, Hey, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to um, chat on the gram. So let's go ahead and get into Q and a Q and a awesome. First of all, uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for, for sharing all this with us. A uh, ton of great knowledge that I learned. I learned today. <laughs> this is not what I should have taken away, but, <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I did learn your craft cocktail enthusiast. Me too. <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah. I always tell yeah. people that like happy hour is my love language. So like <laughs> now next time in New York, we can sit down, Scott. And have a nice go. I've, got, I've got some great recipes, but, oh, but I, I love that. But uh, we'll we'll talk we'll talk about that later. That's not important. <laughs> okay. That's not what we're here talking about. No, no. Uh, so uh, let's start off. Kathy's got a great question. I think this is a wonderful question that Kathy is interested in. Uh, could you please talk about about how far back are you, and uh, how does that play into what effect it has on the image when you're shooting? That is a really great question, and so. Like I said, I'm a film photographer. I shoot on a Hasselblad and I use an 85 millimeter lens. I'm using, I'm shooting medium format though. So it's a little different. That's more like if I were shooting with a 50 millimeter, just to put it out there. So um, I'm usually at a good distance away. And that was, you know, especially over the last couple of years with COVID, I've made sure that I keep my distance from my people as much as possible. But I'm probably like at least, four feet or so, three to four feet away. Um, when I'm photographing, if I want to get up close and I'm photographing like little newborn toes or hands or something like that, I will put um, on a um, those those Hoya lenses, you know, on, on my lens so I can get up a little closer and uh, get those feet and get the hands and those little detail shots. But most of the time I hang back at about, you know, four feet probably, I'm guessing. Wonderful. Now, Jamie would like to know, talked about metering, which I'm happy we talked about. I don't think it's talked about enough. So, no. so definitely I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here and say, you know, if there's one thing you take away from today, get a light meter, but the, uh, it wants to know, do you, Amen, meet... Scott. <laughs> just, just preaching the good word of the light meter. That's <laughs> uh, Jamie wants to know, do you meter for the highlights to shoot at F4? That is such a good question. Um, and it's funny because I actually had a whole thing on that in the, in the talk and I took it out because I'm like, this is not a class on how to meter, but I'm glad you talked about that. I am, I am, okay, this is how it works. It really depends on the medium you're working with. So if you're shooting with a digital camera, digital sensors are extremely sensitive to light. Um, even now with all the technology that has happened in the world of digital cameras, they're still very sensitive to light and it's still easy to blow highlights and that sort of thing when shooting with a digital camera. So when you're metering you, yes, you do always want to meter for your highlights when you're shooting with a digital camera. I wish I had my meter with me right now, but I don't cause I'm working at home, but what that looks like is meter bulb out. And if I were to have the meter here, the bulb would be facing towards the light into the light. All right. Now, if you're a film photographer, I don't know how many film photographers are in the house. I'm a film photographer and film, it has, it, film has a much larger latitude than a digital sensor, especially C41 film, which is traditional color film. And with a film negative, you want to make sure that you're actually erring on the side of overexposure a little bit, which I know is exactly the opposite of a 
digital sensor. And that's because with a film negative, we wanna make sure we have plenty of light in the darkest part of the image, which is in the shadow. So we have what's called a good dense negative. So you can get a good print and scan off that negative. So when you're metering for a digital or for a film camera, you wanna meter in your shadows. So what that looks like is meter here, the bulb, you know, the lumosphere here, facing into the shadow away from the light, all right? Some people will go like this and have their meter here with the bulb here, and that's actually more of a mid-tone reading. Um, so film, meter for your shadows, digital, meter for your highlights. If you're shooting black and white film, you can meter somewhere in between. Do one of those like, mid-tone readings. And if you're shooting ectochrome or any slide film, I know I'm being a giant nerd right now, but if you're shooting ectochrome or any slide film, you want to meter for the highlights. Ectochrome and slide film does not have the latitude that most color films does. So you want to treat it like a digital sensor. Great. I, How was I, that for an answer? I think it's a great answer. I also think you're, you're, you're discrediting yourself. I think there's, there's so many people who are shooting film nowadays. I, you know, obviously there's, there's a huge resurgence of it. In fact, I, I pulled out some, some negatives that I was going to try to make some prints of the other day. So, you know, it, it, it's important. It's important to talk about those things. You're, you're well within right. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> nerd, nerd I know away. it's unusual to shoot film in studio like I do, but I love film. I can talk about that another time too. Yeah. Do I mean, we, we, we did get a question from uh, Kay Clark on YouTube who wanted to know, I'm going to tack on my own question with this, uh, oh, but, sure. but they want to know how long does a baby session usually take for you? Uh, I kind of want to know, you know, tacking onto that, because you're shooting with film, you know, how many rolls do you typically go through in a normal shoot that probably adds to some time loading, reloading, things like that? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is this is a question I get a lot and actually surprises people. So I've been doing this for 23 years, right? So I'm very fast. I'm the mother of twins. I understand like how newborns work, right? The other thing about how I work with newborns is I practice something called baby led posing. I don't do traditional like babies and baskets and holding and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I have a very natural, there's a whole reason behind why I do it that way that I'm happy to talk about. Anybody wants to DM me, but um, so I do just really natural poses. So just, it, you know, the way babies are meant to be positioned is how I, I photograph babies. Be babies. So <laughs> yeah, babies just being babies is enough for me. I don't need to put a baby in a basket for that baby to be cute. But um so my typical newborn session lasts about an hour. And um I'm I don't know I have like this weird superpower like babies I can get babies to sleep like that and um except for my own of course and uh same like with kids and toddlers, like I speak their language. So even when we're working with like a family or a kid, you know, I'm usually about an hour. Sometimes things will go over if, you know, if the baby's having a hard time settling or, you know, we need to feed in the middle of the session or something like that, they can go to an hour and a half, but I'm usually like right about an hour to an hour and a half. Rolls of film, I shoot medium format. And so, and a six, four, five camera. So I get 16 exposures per roll. And I shoot between three to four rolls per session. Very efficient. Sandra Cohen yeah. photography is all about it. Efficiency. <laughs> I, I can tell that's, that, that's, that's a pretty good number because I think, I think, you know, when, when you shoot digital, obviously what is, what is a, an extra shot cost? Nothing. Yeah, exactly. It costs time, obviously, which, which definitely has a value to it. And, you know, we're not here to discuss those merits, but, but, you know, when you're shooting film, that's a whole different array. When, when you shoot one, one shot on that, you know, depending on what film you're shooting, that could be the price of a latte. <laughs> yeah. Even, even more, you know, so, so obviously, you know, I think that takes us in, into a great question that we're getting here from Kalina and uh, wants to know what advantages do you personally feel you have in shooting film versus digital? Um, so I jokingly, not jokingly, I always tell people I shoot film because I'm basically lazy. And the reality is because here's the story. I started shooting in the nineties, right? So back then photography was film photography. We didn't have digital and then digital cameras came along. They weren't great in the beginning. And I felt like I was spending all this time on the computer trying to get my images to look the way they used to look 
when I shot film. And then I was like, well, this is dumb. Why didn't I just shoot film? So I just went back to film. And honestly, you know, I told that timeline, I started, I learned how to uh, work with strobes and flash in 2011, because that was the year I went back to shooting film. And when you're a film photographer, you can't just make it work on a dark and rainy day because film doesn't have the latitude that a digital camera has. You can't just crank up your ISO, right? And uh, when you're shooting a roll of film. So that's really, that was the impetus for me learning to create um, with uh, strobes and flash, my own light. So where was I going? I've gone off the rails. How, when, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no problem. What, what are the advantages that you oh, feel? Advantages. Have? So, okay. What I love about shooting film. So first of all, when it comes to like roll color presets or whatever, you know, like a lot of photographers like to buy presets or Lightroom actions or that kind of stuff. Well, with color film, there's no universal standard for color film. So each formula you know, like Portra 400, Portra 800, Portra 160, Fuji 400, when they were doing that, each one of those is basically like its own preset, right? It has its own color profile, its own, you know, way of capturing greens or reds or whatever like that. So for me choosing my film stock, and I did a lot of research before I settled on Portra 800, um, I know that I'm getting certain tones and qualities and green texture that I really love. So that's step one, right? Also, I just shoot it in camera the way the Lord intended and I'm done. So when my, my scans come back, so I send them off to my lab. I use Richard photo lab. They scan my negatives. They develop my film, scan my negatives and send me back the images. So by that point, it's just a digital product. Like it would have been, and then they're basically perfect. So when I go in to edit my photos, I straighten because I can't shoot straight apparently. And so I straighten my images. I'll take out, you know, like there's like these um, outlets sometimes that get in my photos that are in my wall. I'll do that. But editing an, an entire newborn session takes me about five to 10 minutes. And for me, it's, I, I said, I'm the mother of twins. Like when the boys were little, I had zero time to be sitting in front of the camera or the, the computer editing. So it just, it's a simpler process for me. And also like, I feel like shooting film for me really changed the way changes the way I shoot. I'm a lot more focused. I'm not looking at the back of my camera. Um, I'm slower, like, because like we were just saying, you know, every time I hit the shutter, it costs like the price of a latte. <laughs> and so I want to like, you know, I'm really taking my time. So I just kind of love the whole process of it. Yeah. And uh, you know, just, just to follow that up, you said you, you settled on Portra 800. Nowadays, unfortunately film, you know, manufacturers of film are, are far and few between. And while there is a resurgence of it, there's obviously, you know, we saw Kodak who kind of, you know, closed down and, and stopped producing. Um, Fuji, Fuji closed down, stopped producing. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Fuji. Uh, how do you, how do you kind of wrap your head around that and think to yourself, well, there is that possibility that one day, you know, the inevitable might happen and Portrait 800. You've you've essentially now got to start hoarding rolls of film. I mean, like, why would you even say that out loud, Scott? I feel like you have Sorry. lost your your speaking privileges. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself right now. There you go, mute it. You're like, go sit in the corner and think about what you did. No, um, here's the thing. I don't. I'm not worried about. I mean, there's always something to think about. Um, I work really closely with Kodak and. Um, they're bringing about film stocks all the time. I was actually really honored to be part of the beta test team when they brought the Ektachrome back, both in 35 and in 120. They just reintroduced um, Kodak Gold in 120. So yes, I I'm actually, yeah, I'm like really encouraged about where film is going. Um, I think a lot of people are coming back to it because it's beautiful, it's fun, it's easy. Like I said, if you're like basically a lazy person, you might want to look into it because it really does make the, yeah, right? Right. <laughs> See, we're very similar. We're going to just sit around, drink our craft cocktails and talk about being lazy. And, and but, yeah, just sit on recliners. <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, so, I mean, worst case scenario, if, if film were to go away tomorrow, obviously I would adjust. I've been in business for a long time and you, you know, that's one of the, the, the constants, like one of the things you can count on when you're in business for a long time is that everything's going to change all the time. And so you have to like be willing to adapt. But 
for now, for the foreseeable future, I don't see myself not shooting a film. Awesome. Now, Kathy wants to know, what are the advantages of clients wearing white tops? We saw a lot of images with white tops. What, what, what's, the, what's with that? <laughs> it's so funny. That's a question I get asked all the time. Um, is if I have like, you know, if I tell my clients what to wear and I don't, I think, <laughs> but I really love just like a clean, minimal look in my photos. Like when you see my images, you see a lot of that. And I think over the years, pe- pe- the clients who have come in and have followed me, they go to my portfolio and they see what I'm sharing. And so they just naturally start dressing that way. <laughs> I guess it's a little power of suggestion. You know, there's that whole thing in, you know, in marketing and branding, it's like only show the kind of work you want to shoot more of. And I think that's really true. I think just over the years, I've, I've shared enough images of people in my studio wearing neutrals, because that's what I put on my portfolio and my Instagram, because that's what I like. And so now people just show up dressed like that. Wonderful. Now, Alicia wants to know, uh, specific to where you stand relative to the light. Where mm. is it that you find yourself standing? Uh, she says her light seems to always get in her way. Mm, yeah. So I always have my light at a 45 degree. So I think we saw in the pictures where, can you guys see me? Like, so beds here, right? I have the bed here, baby here. I'll have the light 45 degree and I'm st- sitting right in front of the light. So there is sometimes because I do work with my light so close where I'll hit it with my elbows or whatever, like that happens. But, um, you know, like I was saying in the presentation, like I have my light set and, and I'm always shooting at F4. And so really that light doesn't move throughout my entire session. If I have like a super tall person and then I'm standing them up, I'll bring it up, but I'm, I'm usually always at that 45 degree right there. And I'm just to the right. For some reason, I always like having my light on my left. Like I always shoot with my light on my left. Um, my friend, Rebecca Yale once explained to me why I do that with brain science stuff, but I can't remember what she said, but, um, that's like, that's where I am. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, I think, I think that addressed all of the questions that we got, which is wonderful. I do want to make mention and make note, uh, if, if you want to rewatch this, I implore you to go ahead. I think Sandra shared a ton of great information and dropped some serious knowledge on all of us. You can do that by going ahead and visiting our YouTube page. Uh, obviously, b Photo, that's who we are. Check out the YouTube and it'll be under there. Uh, you can rewatch it on Vimeo, Facebook, any of those channels. If if you're like Sandra and I, and you're just really lazy and, and you don't have time for that, uh, our, our, our team did a wonderful job. They did a, a five tips with Sandra. Uh, so probably, a, I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't watch it beforehand because I didn't, I didn't want to ruin this. I wanted to see <laughs> I wanted to see first and, 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 you know, in person, what, what we were going to get. I didn't want to have any biases, so I didn't watch it, but I'll go in and, and watch it after this. Uh, but I'm sure it's a, a shorter, more condensed version. So if you're, if you're squeezed on time or you're just trying to find that one tip that you were looking for, go ahead and check that out as well. Uh, Sandra, any, any parting words that uh, you'd like to leave our audience with? No, I just hope every, I really, really want to encourage everybody to give it a try. I know studio lighting is something that freaks people out. Um, It's really not that scary. It's not as scary as you think. Like that's like what I was trying to drive home. If you can, if you can do it with a window, you can do it with a light. So give it a try, you know, rent some equipment, play around with it and, and see what you think. And like I said, if you do have any, any questions or you want any resources on where to get started, or even a printout on my equipment list that I shared here on the talk. You can just um, find all that information on my Instagram in the link in bio. Awesome. Wonderful. I, I, I will quote the great movie of dodgeball. If you could dodge a wrench, you could dodge a ball. There you go. <laughs> you use, if you could use a window, you could use a light. Probably completely missed the point there. but uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty accurate. I'm going to use that for now on. There you go. Huge, huge thanks to you, Sandra. We really appreciate it. Uh, also, a huge thanks as well to our sponsors over at Westcott for setting this up. For everybody tuning in, we appreciate you 